God for Dennis. Because if it wasn't for him, I'd be up there by myself. You guys don't want that. Thank you, Dennis. Let's give him a hand. It's, uh, it's interesting when a pastor leaves and the praise team leaves. It's just Dennis and me, and Dennis and I love each other. I say he's a good guy. Well, I love Dennis and I love you. Um, but he's a good guy, and I really appreciate him. Uh, it's so good to see you guys here today. Uh, you look fantastic. And I'm excited about just bringing God's word to you this morning. But before we do that, I want you to do something with me. I want you to look at some things, okay? And tell me what you see. I'm going to ask you some very specific questions. Doug, if you could go to my first, my first diagram, if you would please. First picture. Okay, so if you look at those lines, the horizontal lines, which one of the lines is longer? Say again? Neither. Neither. Yeah, Jennifer said neither. I can't believe that. Or is it neither? Potato, potato. Maybe it's not so. I think it, I think it looks interesting. Is, you say that neither one of those lines, the horizontal lines, neither one of them is longer. And that's, and that's true. That's true. Why is that? Because it's an optical illusion. It's an optical illusion. Okay? You with me? Let's go to the next one. Let's see the next one. What do you see when you look at that picture? Yeah, I see a shadow, right? There's a shadow there. It looks like the shadow is being cast by whatever that woman is standing on, right? It does to me. It did to me, anyway. Uh, it does, though. It looks like she's kind of floating in the air. If you look at that, it looks like the shadow is underneath her. But in reality, what's happening is there is a flag that's in front of her that's casting a shadow. And because of that, it is an optical illusion. Folks, I'm here to tell you that. It's interesting, when we look at things, our eyes can deceive us. Do you believe that this morning? Our eyes can deceive us. And so what we have to do is on occasion we have to go back and reevaluate. We need to find some other frame of reference to use because our eyes can deceive us. Next picture, please. When you look at that picture, what do you see? A lot of people sing high, right? But Andy sees a sink. And indeed, that's exactly what it is. When you look at it, it looks like an eye. But what's going on is there's actually water spinning down a sink there. How can I prove that? Look at the edges and you can see the sides. Your eyes can deceive you. Sometimes you have to go and get another frame of reference. You need another perspective. Because our eyes can deceive us. Now, this name I'm go up there. Don't, don't change it yet, Doug. Uh, so this next one is, is pretty important to me because my wife and I have an argument about it, as I'm sure that many other husbands and wives have arguments <coughs> about this specific picture. Go ahead, Doug. <laughs> what color is the dress? Blue. Now, see, people say blue, and I don't see that. I mean, everybody says blue, I don't see that. I see gold and white. Gold? Yeah, and people look at me and say gold. Isn't that crazy? But what's going on here is something's happening, something's going on. Our eyes are seeing differently than what's really there. When I see gold, I can go and look at the actual grass and see that it's defined as being blue and white. But I see gold and white. My eyes can deceive me. I need another frame of reference. I need to find some other frame of reference that can help me understand what I'm saying. And folks, that's not just in pictures like that. Eye teasers, optical illusions that can confuse you. No, no. It can happen in many different areas of our lives. Sometimes in our lives we can be told by others that we're not worth very much. Sometimes in our lives, we can be told by, sadly enough, parents in some cases, that we're not worth very much. Sometimes it can be a teacher or a football coach or a baseball coach. Sometimes it can be your boss who says you're not worth very much. And that can be a devastating blow, especially for a child, but even for an adult. And folks, what we want to do today is we want to evaluate ourselves, us, 
you and me, from another perspective. Because sometimes when I look at myself, I think, Mike, I can't believe you sinned again. Have you ever been there? Mike, I can't believe that you did that again. I can't believe you didn't give it up again, Mike. I can't believe you didn't do enough. I can't believe you didn't help those people. When I look through a lens at myself, my own personal lens, sometimes I look and I say, my goodness, you're not worth much. The folks today, we need to see what we look like from God's perspective. Today, I want to encourage you, and I want you to see that in God's eyes, you're something special. And folks, today, today we're going to look at you through his lens and see that you've got something to learn. So if you would please, open your Bibles, turn to Colossians, turn to Colossians. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, as you're turning. Oh, it's so important. There are so many things that we see today. I, I saw something the other day on the news. As you're turning there, I'm just going to share a little story with you. I, I saw something on the news that where it talked about people who are being shamed because of their size. Um, They're a little bit overweight. The kids are being shamed in school because of that. I also heard the kids are being shamed in schools because of the clothes they wear, uh, because they're not the right brands, specifically. Uh, I remember when I went to school, I didn't know what brand it was. As a matter of fact, my mom, mom sometimes wanted me to go and look at the clothes that my sister used to wear. I won't talk too much about it. But it's not the dress, it's the you know, jeans and that. Uh, but it never really worked out. So we're in Colossians, we're going to start in Colossians chapter 13. The reason we're going to start there is because we need to understand, first and foremost, before we can understand what God says we are, before we look at His sight, we've got to understand who He is. We've got to know who God is. We've got to understand who Christ is. We're going to do that here in chapter 13. So, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. And it says here in Colossians, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. First and foremost, first and foremost, this Jesus is a Savior. He is a Savior. We can have redemption through His blood. He can take us and completely regenerate us through Him. He can cause whatever is in us that is dead to start living again. He can bring us directly from death into life. He can take us from the fiery furnace and bring us to an eternal life. He is the Savior, and He can change your life today. If you don't know who He is, you've got to know who He is, because the Savior is mighty and powerful and incredible. Folks, first and foremost, the Scripture says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood that covers us and the forgiveness of our sins that separate us from a holy God. He is the Savior and He brings us into the very presence of God. Not only is He the Savior, though, not only is He the Savior, but He is the Creator as well. We look in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. It says here, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. When it says firstborn there, folks, the implication is not that Jesus Christ was born. The implication is not that Jesus Christ did not exist in eternity past. Certainly he was manifested as a child here on this planet. He was brought here and manifested himself in the form of a child, fully God, fully man. But Jesus was from the beginning. He is eternal, the same way the Father and the Spirit are eternal. Jesus Christ is eternal. When it says here he is the firstborn of all creation, that word firstborn means he is the preeminent. He is the ruler of it. He is the leader of it. He is the beginning of all creation. It says here, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. That covers just about everything. Everything in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Anything you can imagine, Jesus Christ was there. Created it, 
whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And this is important as well, folks. I can stand here and talk for days on creation. I don't want to, though, because I don't want to worry. But I can tell you this you got to believe that. He is the creator of all things. It's an amazing thing. But this year is what's, what's good. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And folks, in the scripture, it says these words. Look at the very bottom there on that screen. In him, all things consist. If you go back to the Greek and see what consist means, it means literally that he is holding things together. Right now, today, he is holding things together. This entire universe would spin out of control if it were not for a holy God holding it together. Praise God that he is. Folks, he's not just the Savior, he's not just the Creator. But he's also the head of the church. Here it says in, in verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Again, that firstborn means preeminent. That in all things he may have the preeminence. He is the head of the body. Folks, we are a church right here. This is a church body. But the greater church body is larger. It's all believers. And he is the head of that entire body. That entire body of believers, Jesus Christ is the head of them all. Folks, when we say that this, this being, this Jesus, this part of the Godhead, is not only a savior, not only creator, is not only the head of the church, we're saying that he is something incredible, he is something magnificent. Folks, the thing that I love is that he is something, he is someone that is looking at us and he has his view about what we are. We're going to see what that is in just a second. Not only is he those three things I just mentioned, not only is he those three, but he's also something else. He's the beloved of the Father. The Father loves him. And the Father is pleased with him. Let's look at verse 19, moving quickly. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. All the fullness should dwell. We talked about this word this morning in Sunday Bible study. That word fullness in the Greek is pleroma. Pleroma. And what that word means is literally is the sum total of all the divine power and attributes in the universe. Now hear this, folks. This is so important. All the divine power in the entire universe dwells in Jesus Christ. Well, the joy and the peace that I have known that when I struggle on this earth, and I do, and you do. Oh, the peace and joy of knowing that when I feel like I can't take any more, that I have someone on my side who cares about me, who desires to help me, who knows me by name, that has all of the divine power in the entire universe on his side, and therefore it's on whose side? My side. Praise the Lord. Oh, the joy. For it pleased the Father, in verse 19, that in him all fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Well, the blood of Jesus is powerful. Not only did the blood of Jesus cover our sin, but the blood of Jesus made possible the reconciliation of the entire kingdom. Folks, the gospel is so powerful. The gospel is so powerful. The death of Jesus and the shedding of his blood is so powerful. Not just because he gave us a home in heaven, which he did, and I praise him for that. But also, folks, because, also because the reconciliation of the entire creation comes about through that same shed of blood. There will be a day when the reconciliation will happen. What a blessing that is. When things will be brought back the way they are supposed to be because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Folks, when we talk about in whose sight we want to be viewed, it's not my best friend, it's not, it's not my father or my mother. Folks, it is Jesus Christ who I want to be The all-powerful, all man Son of God. The second thing we need to know, besides who, who is looking at us, who he is, the second thing we want to know is we need to know what we want. Look in Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 here it says 
And you who were once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Alienated means estranged or separated. Alienated literally means estranged or separated. So that means that you're here, I'm there, we're separated and estranged from each other. Enemies, it's a little simple word, it means actively hostile. So what the implication there is, when it says, when the Apostle Paul says, through inspired by the Holy Spirit, and you, once, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind, implies is that we were enemies of God. Enemies of God. And if you look back in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, it says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is in battle against God. It is at war with God. If you are not a child of God, you are an enemy of God. I think you dropped that on me, but that's a truth that we all need to know today. Not a friend of God. If you are not a friend of God, you are an enemy of God. And that's the implication here in these words. And as Paul writes this, he's writing to believers. He's saying, this is what you used to be. And folks, I can tell you, after I discussed everything that God is, that Jesus Christ is, in the first part of this sermon, I know that none of us want to be in the kingdom. That kind of power, that kind of authority, but also that kind of love that he has for you and for me. Folks, he reminded us that we were alienated, estranged, separated, and actively hostile towards God. But even so, even so, even because, as we were still estranged from him, as we were in him, he did something. We need to understand what he did to understand his perspective of us. And what he did was this. Again, starting in verse 21 of Colossians chapter 1. And I just want to start with Really, the first part of that verse is so powerful. And you, who once were alienated, the enemies of your mind, in your mind by wicked works. We ran into never alienated. Yet now he has been reconciled. He has brought us back. He has retrieved us from where we were. Reconciled. And how do we do it? In the body of his flesh. And how? Through death. One of my favorite verses in all scripture is this. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. You probably won't find hard. But God commended, God showed, God demonstrated, God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were fighting against him, while we were enemies against the Holy God, Christ came and died for us. The implication of those words is just so powerful and so incredible, and it's fascinating to me that he would do that. Because I can't understand how I would give my life for him. As a believer, he would still ask questions with that thought. And yet I was an enemy of God, and he sent his son to die for me. My goodness, it's unbelievable. He has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Reconciled us. And why did he do it? And this is why this is the payoff for the entire sermon. I haven't kept you long, there's a reason for that, and I don't want to keep you long today because I want you to focus on this last part. Because it matters so much, folks. Because in his side is where you're defined. You're not defined by a friend. You're not defined by a family member. You're not defined by a spouse sitting beside you. You are defined in his side. What he tells you, you are. And what does God say? What does Christ say? For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, starting in verse 19, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things, things on earth, 
into heaven, having the peace of the blood of his cross, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Why did he do all that? Why did he go through all that? To present us. To present you. Holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. What does holy mean? Holy means set apart. Set apart. It's the same word that we use for saint. If you're saved and you're a believer today, you're a saint. What a blessing that is. But holy simply means set apart. Express the idea of being set apart for the Lord by God. What does blameless mean? Without blemish, in the same way that the Lamb of God died for us without blemish. We are seen covered in His blood without blemish. And then finally, above reproach. What does that mean? And this is what I love. I love it. Above reproach means free from accusation. Free from accusation. There is one called Satan who is an accuser. He's a liar, he's a thief, he's a destroyer, but he's also an accuser. And he would love to accuse us. He would love to go to God and say, Yeah, but look at Mike. He's really bad. This guy is just awful. He sins every day. Look at this, he's sinning every day. And the Father will look at us. There is no condemnation, there is no accusation. Because in my sight, he is holy, he is blameless, he is above reproach, and you can never, never, never chastise my child in front of me. Folks, I can tell you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people say about you, it doesn't matter what they think about you. The holy God of the universe, in his sight, sees you as blameless, holy. And above reproach. The blessing of that, and the peace of that, and the joy of that is beyond belief. And I pray that every person here knows that love, and knows that joy, and knows that peace. So now, the question is, what do we do? If we know that we're holy and blameless and above reproach in this sight, what do we do? Well, I may not. Scripture tells us what we ought to do. There's a character that we ought to have. It's moving on in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, in verse 12, it tells us exactly what we ought to do. Please turn there. It's not going to be on the screen. I want you to look at your Bibles here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, we are set apart, we're called by him, we are his. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, do what? Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. How? Even as Christ forgave you. So you also must do. But above all these things, put on love. Put on love. And the word there is not the kind of love we think about. It's not the feeling of love or the other type of love. Right? This is the agape. Put on love. Put on God-like love to those around you, which is the bond of perfection, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Next, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. You do it all in the name of him. Folks, I want to encourage you today. Regardless of what someone has told you you are in the past, your eyes can deceive them. Whatever somebody may have told you you were this day, last week, or yesterday, or maybe even today, I don't believe it. Their eyes can deceive them. Whatever you told yourself, if you looked in the mirror this morning, you think about yourself. Don't believe it. 
your eyes can deceive you. I want you to know that if you're a believer this morning, folks, I want to encourage you by saying that you're a child of the living God, holy, blameless, and above reproach in His sight. And nothing else has ever mattered in your life. In His sight, as a child of God, you are holy, blameless, and above reproach. Folks, never get back, okay?